The American Civil War drew to a close over 150 years ago, ending a period of five years during which the southern states of the United States formed their own independent confederacy. The North won the war, and the United States were restored, ending the South's period of self-rule. However, the memory, imagery, and iconography are still very much remembered and revered in the former confederacy. I was inspired to make this video a few nights ago whilst making fajitas and watching an excellent video by fellow history YouTuber Tom Ritchie about the way in which the Confederacy is interpreted. I'd highly recommend going over and watching that video after finishing this one. The removal of several statues in New Orleans of Confederate Generals Robert E. Lee and PGT Beauregard got me thinking about the way in which the Confederate past is viewed in the South, as the events and symbolism of over a century and a half ago still evoke strong emotions today. The Confederate past is certainly unmissable in the South. There are statues of Confederate officers in major cities, and much of the population proudly defend their right to flying various Confederate flags, most popular of all, the horizontal Confederate battle flag, often displayed with the slogan, Heritage, not hate. Flags have been a surprisingly controversial issue in the South in the last few years, after the removal of the battle flag from South Carolina's State House in 2016. Many of the former Confederate states' own state flags have symbolism relating to the Confederacy's previous flags. Alabama's flag is based on the 60th Alabama Infantry's battle flag, and follows a similar design to that of the Confederate battle flag. Georgia's many flags over the years all harken back to a connection with the Confederate state flag, or battle flag, as do that of Mississippi and North Carolina. Hundreds of street names in the South are also named after important Confederate figures such as General Lee, Beauregard, Pickett, Stonewall Jackson, and others. But why does the South have this obsession with its Confederate past of over 150 years ago, when many are calling it out to be a racist one, intertwined with white supremacist ideals and the oppression of black people? To understand the South's fascination with the Confederacy, we have to go back to when it was formed in the heat of the antebellum, before the nation was consumed by war. The reasons why the United States erupted in all-out civil war are much debated, and it's safe to say there were many different factors contributing to it. The North-South divide, state rights, abolitionism, honor, religion, free labor, constitutionalism, and republicanism all played an important part in why the Confederacy seceded and why war broke out, although all of these factors were in some way connected to the large elephant in the room, slavery. The entire economy in the South was based around it, and would fail to function without the forced labor provided by the enslaved African workforce, who overturned a huge profit for their white masters on the cotton, tea, sugar, and tobacco plantations of the South. A future without slavery was not one in which the South would remain the agrarian and economic powerhouse it was. When it became clear that abolitionist Abraham Lincoln, the Republican candidate of the 1861 election, would win the race for president, South Carolina acted first and declared independence from the United States on the 20th of December, 1860. Soon most of the southern states also seceded to stand with South Carolina and form the Confederate States of America. South Carolina's motivation for self-rule was certainly the ability to keep her African slaves in bondage, although some of the later states to join the rebels did so to stop northern soldiers marching across the territory to do battle with the secessionists to the south. The war began with the Confederate bombardment of Union forces in Fort Sumter, which was now in Confederate-occupied Virginia on the 12th of April. The course of the war in the east would be one of defending northern advances into the south like at Bull Run in 1861, followed by failed probes north like at Antietam in 62. The victories at the stalwart defense of Fredericksburg and Chancellorsville might have lulled the soldiers on the Eastern Theater into a sense that the South was winning the war, although in reality the fall of New Orleans early on by assault from Union steamships and the tightening of the trade embargo crudely named the Anaconda Plan was slowly sucking the life from the Confederacy. When Lee's final push north was bloodily beaten down at Gettysburg in 1863, the end of the South's independent experiment was in sight. The war from that point was fought predominantly on Confederate soil, until General Lee surrendered the Army of Northern Virginia in April of 1865 at Appomattox Courthouse. With the defeat of the Confederacy in 1865 came the spread of the Lost Cause Mythos, which argued that the South had been hopelessly outgunned and outmanned against a far superior Northern foe, yet had held out for five years before the final capitulation. For many Southerners returning home, this is how they and their fellow countrymen viewed the war, 
as the glorious struggle against hopeless odds, which was doomed to eventual failure from the start. The fact that outnumbered, largely newly formed and inexperienced Confederate armies under the now legendary generals like Stonewall Jackson and Robert E. Lee had ever inflicted decisive military defeats on the trained Federal Army of the United States at all made their efforts all the more praiseworthy to Southerners. The way the final defeat of the Confederacy was brought home by the Union also contributed to a heroic attachment of the Civil War and the Confederate past. Northern Generals Sherman and Sheridan employed scorched earth policies, destroying vast areas of the South's infrastructure, property and what little industry there was. Sheridan was famous for the Burning Raid of 1864, which specifically targeted the livestock and houses of Confederates in the Shenandoah Valley, resulting in the killing and displacement of over 10,000 cattle and the destruction of hundreds of buildings and the burning of tens of thousands of tons of props. Sherman's more famous march to the sea in Georgia might have been forgotten in the North soon after the war, but stayed rooted in the South's memory of the Northern invasion of their homeland. With the invasion came the inevitable contact between the Union soldiers and Confederate civilians, and with it the inevitable violence and sexual violence invading armies often bring with them. Though Lincoln had issued orders strictly prohibiting any violence, sexual or otherwise, against the Southern population, the war is rife with it. Because of the Union's actions to bring the war to a close in 1864 and 1865, Southerners could justify the secession and their ancestors' reasons for fighting in the first place as fighting to defend their homes against Northern invasion. Because of this distinction, many Southerners see this as the real reason for the Civil War, and therefore feel justified in their honouring the Confederate past, where others liken it to the Nazi past in Europe. In some ways, Southerners are justified to this belief. Although the figure is debated, only around a third of men fighting for the Confederacy owned slaves themselves, and gave their reasons in diaries, letters and songs as being the defence of their states against what they saw as tyrannical northern oppression and meddling in southern state affairs. It's also important to remember the human cost of the Civil War, the accepted figure sitting at 620,000 deaths, although it's likely closer to 750,000. Although the traditional figure cites 360,000 Union deaths and 260,000 Confederate deaths, it's likely there were more Southern deaths not recorded due to the loss of records and muster rolls when the South was invaded. Even when using the traditional figure, it becomes instantly clear how destructive the Civil War was for the United States, but especially the South. One in five Southern white males aged between 13 and 43 died during the Civil War. 2% of the entire population perished in the Civil War from both sides, and it can be seen as an American holocaust because if a proportional amount were to die in the United States today, 6 million lives would be lost. Though more men from the North were killed, the impact was far greater for the South, which had a much smaller population and no huge cities like New York or Boston where huge numbers of men enlisted to fight. The traditional total of 620,000 killed was not equaled by all American military deaths until the Vietnam War in the 70s. The huge scale of those who fought and died affected everyone in the South without a doubt, and more so than in the North, which is perhaps why the memory of the Civil War is so much stronger to the South of the Mason-Dixie line. The period of reconstruction in the South from the end of the war until 1877 is also important for the solidification of the Southern mythos about the war and understanding its importance to many Southerners today. After the destruction of the scorched earth policies employed both by Northern generals and retreating Southern troops, the South was left in ruins. Reconstruction involved the occupation of the former Confederacy by Northern soldiers, who facilitated the emancipation of black people, and after the Republican landslide of 1867, radically reconstructed the South, enabling the former slaves to vote and hold office for the first time, which many of them did. The white Southerner in the meantime had not only lost a war, but also a way of life. The slave-based Southern economy that had been so successful in the antebellum years suddenly collapsed affecting everyone in the South when black people were no longer the legal property of their masters. In the post-war years, during both the Reconstruction and later eras, most black and white Southerners were living in abject poverty. Part of the North's main Reconstruction goal was the reconstruction of the Southerners' minds, which involved thousands of Northerners settling in the South to teach Northern values in Southern schools. Sixty of these men, who became known as carpetbaggers, were also elected to Congress on a radical Republican platform. 
without the carpetbaggers' intervention and an us creating an us and them situation in the South, perhaps reconstruction would have been more successful and the memory of the Civil War might have been put to rest. The hardships of the Reconstruction era for many Southern whites would have made the Civil War seem all the more justified, as in hindsight they could argue why their ancestors had fought was to avoid the future they were now living in under Northern oppression. This would explain a Southern idolization of the Civil War and the Confederacy in the post-war era when poverty and carpetbaggers were an issue in the former Confederate states. But this idolization has not gone away. One correlation between the post-war years and the South of more modern times is the general and widespread poverty faced by its people. The Huffington Post wrote that the South is essentially a solid, grim block of poverty, which has in essence been true of the South since the end of the Civil War, even after the monetary intervention during Reconstruction. The US Census comparison of 2000 to 2010 shows that the South as a geographic entity was by a large margin that with the most people living in poverty and had the second largest increase in people living in poverty over the decade. When viewing this on a map in the context of the former Confederacy, there is a very clear distinction between the former Confederate States and the rest of the United States, but especially contrasting with those states that had opposed them in the Civil War with the exception of West Virginia. The popular image of a southerner, especially that of a southerner with an attachment to the old confederate imagery, is the stereotype of the white trash redneck hillbilly. People waving and defending confederate flags are often belittled by the media for being uneducated, backward, and the likelihood is that someone displaying or defending the imagery of the confederacy will be on average poorer than someone opposed to it. The debate on Confederate imagery, such as the public and state display of the Confederate battle flag, or statues of Confederate politicians like Jefferson Davis, or Confederate generals like Robert E. Lee and General Pickett, is often viewed as a racial one between white supremacist Southern whites and their historically oppressed Southern blacks. However, the debate is increasingly a social one, with both white and black people defending and opposing the memory of the Confederacy, and it's being more divided along socio-economic lines, rather than the issue being a black and white one. When looking at the issue in a cultural, historic light, it is perhaps also not surprising that Southerners choose the Civil War as their well from which to draw their cultural, heritage and background. When comparing a shared Southern American identity and a European, say, Dutch shared identity, it becomes very apparent that the Southern American has far less history to choose from. Most Southerners have only ancestry in the New World for only around 200 years, and given that this is the shared aspect of their identity they have in common with their fellow Southerners, it limits the choice. For Dutch people, there is a shared history already starting before the Romans, but really becoming clear with the founding of the County of Holland and such shared features across what would become the Netherlands, like language and some aspects of culture. The nation was born from the flames of the Eighty Years' War, when the Dutch had to fight for their freedom against the Spanish, followed by the Golden Age when the Dutch were the most advanced nation on earth, with a global mercantile empire, dwarfing that of England and other world powers at the time. Even in the defeat of the French invasions under Napoleon led to a more cultural unification between Dutchmen with the return of the House of Orange in 1813 with the following years of monarchy. Even then, the German occupation during the Second World War also brought unity for Dutch people and today the Netherlands still punches far above its weight for such a small country that has literally been struggling against the sea throughout its lifetime. Now let's take a look at the South's cultural history. The first colonization of the South came from Spanish settlers in Florida, the English, Irish, Scotch-Irish and the Scottish in Virginia and the Carolinas, the Germans in Texas and French settlers in Louisiana, as well as a general spread throughout the South of all of these groups. The American Revolution saw much action in the territory that would later become the Confederacy, although by far the most influential conflict fought there would be the Civil War. Tom Ritchie discussed in his video the idea of the Confederacy as another, un-American entity, thus foreign, and in this light we can see the secession of the southern states as the foundation of an independent nation. National sentiments between different groups are very strong, for example the national sentiment of the Scottish, even though they are very much alike their English neighbours. 
Much of the following history of the American Southerner directly influenced by the war, the humiliation of defeat, reoccupation, reconstruction, and then the debacle of the Jim Crow era, the rise of the Ku Klux Klan, and the violent opposition of the civil rights movement in the 1950s and 60s. When viewed in a timeline like this, it becomes clear why Southerners chose the Civil War as their era of cultural and regional identity, which provides very strongly today. From a nostalgic point of view, the Civil War and antebellum era can be seen as times of faded glory for white Southerners when their men and women held out against those who now stereotype them as rednecks and racists for five years and handed them several defeats before the descent of the South into a long slump infused with poverty, deprivation and racial violence and horror by the likes of both the Jim Crow authorities and the Ku Klux Klan. And that history has been less than flattering. In reality, the Confederacy was no paradise for both its white subjects or its black slaves, who would have remained in bondage indefinitely, and the prospect of an independent South, though an interesting topic for alternate history theories, would have been far more difficult in realisation. But this is the irrelevant to the modern Southern mythos concerning the Confederate memory, which is intertwined with what actually happened. They lost, their independence was taken from them, and the slaves were freed. After the war, efforts were certainly made to return the South to its antebellum state, although this is a recurring pattern throughout history, where one dominant group loses power, and a small fraction of this group then work, often by terrorist means, to regain it, with terrorist action against the other group. In the South, this is no exception, with groups like the Ku Klux Klan targeting predominantly black people in their attempts to reassert white, or in other words, confederate authority over the lands that had once formed the confederacy. Thanks to the Ku Klux Klan, who often used Confederate symbolism, and the, which was indeed started by Nathan Bedford Forrest, a, a Confederate general, this has often also been mixed into the equation of the Confederate heritage, as this, the Ku Klux Klan and their post-war era in the South, is now also an unmistakable part of that history. So why hasn't this more recent racially oriented history of violence altered the Southern obsession with the Confederacy? And what conclusions can be drawn from this analysis of the Civil War? To begin with, the Southern backdrop to the war is seen differently. They see it as the necessary fight to keep the Union soldiers from committing the atrocities and enforcing federal laws upon them, which they did later on in the war. The average soldier's reasons for fighting certainly weren't limited to, or even necessarily included, the continued existence of slavery, but sought to protect the newly formed nation, a nation that to their mind followed the American Constitution, as laid down by the Founding Fathers, against the tyranny of a radical Republican government hundreds of miles away in Washington, attempting to take their rights away from them. The sort of nostalgic yearning and attachment to everything confederate also has some grounds in the past and present. On average, the richest area in 1860 is now the poorest area, and the antebellum south, which exported 75% of the world's cotton, had a sense of regional, national and international pride and importance. For southerners, the war then can be interpreted as a war fought to preserve this way of life. A way of life which hinged on the exploitation of African labour, but a way of life which vanished and dashed the South into 150 years of poverty and deprivation after they lost. The war too can be seen as a solely Southern affair, rather than a civil war. It was fought because of the South's secession. It was fought for the vast majority in the South. Those targeted were Southern soldiers and Southern civilians, and resulted in the occupation of the South, followed by the steep economic decline of the South. Due to this, it can easily be argued that if the South had won and occupied the North, then the North would hold somewhat a similar view as many Southerners do referring to their past today, inclusive or exclusive of a history of slavery and a subsequent racial violence. There is obviously no Northern lost cause myth, although perhaps a messiah complex, with a certain degree of snobbery aimed at the backward rebellious Southerners, also alienated post-war Southerners, who poor, defeated and looked down upon, may eagerly have taken up the Confederate its rebel heritage as one of defiance simply because the north and politically correct aspects of society told them that they couldn't. 
The South's obsession with the Confederacy then can be seen as one of honouring ancestors they believed fought on the right side of history because of northern atrocities during an invasion of the Confederacy, and that out of the South's history, the Civil War is by far the most defining aspect, which has irrevocably influenced it from 1865 up until today. So it should come as no surprise that this obsession with the Confederate pasts exists in the first place. This is just my interpretation of why I think many people in the South hold these strong beliefs about the Confederacy. Though I'm not saying that these beliefs are 100% right or 100% wrong, or that either side in the Civil War was 100% right or 100% wrong, but this is just my interpretation of why I think it's the way it is and why so many people have such strong opinions and such strong emotions come up when talking about this. So I'm History with Hilbert, if you're new and you enjoyed this please do subscribe, I'd love to have you on board. I upload quite often, I'll put the links to Tom Ritchie's video in the description, highly recommend you watch it, as well as music and some other things. Thanks very much.